Hi, I'm Brian Tima, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Our prayer is that God use this as an incredible resource to align your heart with His. We know that you're not always able to plug into a local church, but we highly encourage that. Yet we are grateful to be able to offer this resource to you. And if you find that you've been ministered greatly by something that the Ministry of Grace Spring has been doing, feel free to check out our website in ways that you might be able to serve or give. Now let's prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Worship leaders here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here and invite you to stand as we sing together to our Savior and our King of Kings. Off we go. We're going to clap our hands a little bit this morning and have some fun, so get ready.
Amen. It is good to sing with brothers and sisters in Christ and to lift up the name of Jesus. Um, as we continue to sing this morning, um, we're going to teach you a new song, and um, it's based on Psalm 150. So right, you look for some keywords in here. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with a trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. 
Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So did anybody pick up on the key word in that song? Praise. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't say like, um, sing quietly with your mouth kind of open, your hands in your pockets. It says praise. And, and when we do that, we celebrate, we lift up the name of Jesus. We declare that he is better than anything else that we could ever pursue. And so this song, um, it actually starts off with us singing that last verse. Um, this is a little different than what Grace Spring Bible Church is probably known for. So we're going to challenge you a little bit this morning. Even we were challenged this week. But we're going to shout out, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we're going to do that together. Let's try it once without any music. Ready? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You guys got it. All right. He's going to add some drums for us. That will probably help a little bit with just the tempo. We're going to clap our hands. As I've said in the past, please stay on tempo or else we'll shut off the clapping. So, All right. Here we go. Here we go. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting.
Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Just your voice this time. Here we go. Let everything. You memorized some scripture this morning. You go home and tell your friends, I memorized the Bible today. And they'll go, man, that's so cool. Where'd you do that? You'll say, you know, church. Um, this next song we're going to sing is just to get our hearts kind of focused in a, in a place of intimacy with our Lord. Um, there are many names that our, our world will worship, but we know that the best of all is the name of Jesus.
Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. Help us to never get tired of singing out praises to you, Lord, to, to recognize and be thankful for the beautiful name of Jesus and all that it has done through our history and will continue to do generation after generation. Lord, we pray that this morning our hearts and our minds will be open to, to just a continuous act of worship um, through singing, through learning, through reading, uh, through loving one another. Let us do all things for your glory, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm Pastor Brian and wanted to tell you, welcome to church. We are so excited to have you with us this morning. I've just returned from a trip with Mission India and I'm excited to share more about this in the weeks to come. For those of you who may not know, Mission India is one of the ministries we have partnered with through Christ Followers for Change, also known as CFC, which is a local group of churches that we have been a part of now for several years. We've had the opportunity to come alongside different ministries, both through prayer and through financial support. And it has been an incredible blessing to see what the Lord has done. Take a look at this message from those who are part of our CFC giving campaign last year. Greetings, Christ followers for change. Adam Sternberg here, head of school, of Path of Life and Tree of Life School. I just wanted to reach out and thank you guys so much for your incredible donation last year, which helped us launch Path of Life High School with ninth grade. And praise God, we've added 10th grade this year and kids are continuing to soar and find their calling and their purpose and their passion in life. And we wanna just thank you, Christ followers for change. Christ followers for change. My name is Bill Knott and I'm with Mission India. Just here to say thanks for partnering with us over the past six or seven years as y'all has invested in districts across India. Many, many families have come to know Jesus Christ as a result of your investment. Men and women, boys and girls, have given their lives to follow Jesus Christ in a manner that they wouldn't have been able to had you not partnered with us. Thank you very much for your partnership. Hi, church family. My name is Kathy Stoner. I'm the executive director of Alternatives, and I have with me a, one of the newest members of the Alternatives team. Hi, my name is Bethany. Um, I am the new sonographer at Alternatives, so I get to do the ultrasounds on all the babies, and I'm really excited to be part of the Alternatives team here. Yeah, and so we want to thank you, Christ followers, for change, because your generosity and prayers and gifts have given us the ability to provide these in-the-moment ultrasounds to women who are making huge decisions and need the education and information that Alternatives is offering. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for your prayers and your support. And just know that God is using your gifts for great things. Thank you, CFC. Thank you so much, Christ Forward, for change for all your support. Um, you are investing in the lives of the children from the community of Centro de Alcance, Pinula. You are helping us transform this community through holistic programs such as discipleship, and nutrition, tutoring, and some economic uh, activities. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing for us. You can see that God is doing amazing work through this partnership, and He is continuing to do so. We are currently in the midst of a financial campaign for CFC, having set a goal of $40,000 above our normal offering to be raised by November 26th. This offering will support five different ministries throughout the world. Shalom, Naomi's Village, Response Care Center, Urban Alliance, and Hope Chess Guatemala. You can learn more about these organizations online and through our latest growth guide available on our website. You're able to give via cash or check at any time through the offering boxes located in the back of the auditorium. And we also be passing the plate during both services on Sunday, November 26th. Thank you so much for considering this wonderful opportunity. And now I'd love to introduce to you our teacher for the morning, Pastor Michael Brown. Pastor Brown is a president and CEO of Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries and has been a longtime friend of Grace Spring. KGM has served the community of Kalamazoo for more than 90 years, 
offering radical hospitality in the name of Jesus to people who are dealing with hunger, homelessness, abuse, and addiction. We are blessed to have Pastor Brown with us this morning, so please help me to welcome him. And we'll see you soon, church. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Good morning. I'm excited to be here this morning. It's good to be back at the uh, Grace Spring. You guys, I don't know if you all know this or not, but you guys are our church family as well. Um, this, this local assembly, we have so many friends here. Uh, good to have with us this morning our daughter Camille, who's visiting from Orlando uh, with us. And uh, so we're glad to be here. Um, you know, every time I try to do something technical, <laughs> it, that's, why, that's why I print my notes too, you know? It's, it's like, come on now, well, how come stuff don't work? Um, <clears throat> yeah, Rosemary and I are gonna be celebrating. You all, most of y'all know my wife. Wave, honey, wave with everybody. <laughs> Tuesday, we'll be celebrating 25 years. She don't look that old, do she? <laughs> 25 years, and so we're excited about that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here this morning because I want to talk to y'all this morning a little bit about a deeper communion, a deeper communion. Usually when we think of communion, you know, we think of the elements, we think of the Eucharist, we think of, you know, taking communion, we call it, but but communion is a deeper relationship. It's a relationship with someone where you share thoughts and even the intent of your heart, you share that. And this is the kind of relationship that I wanna to talk to you all about this morning that we wanna have with Christ. A deeper, a deeper relationship. And, and for me, the best way for us to do that is to talk about a little bit about those people that Christ had a relationship with when he was here. We're gonna, we're gonna go through a couple of scriptures and then we wanna talk about, so what does he expect of us? Now, one of the things I want you to do, we all know that the word talks about us having our minds renewed, okay? So sometimes uh, um, when you hear a message or something that challenges you, at least allow yourself to ask God, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this information? What does that mean to me? So I've told you all this before, the most important thing you're gonna hear this morning is not what I say to you. The most important thing you're gonna hear this morning is what God says to you about what I'm about to say to you. Is that all right? Okay, I mean, because all of us come from somewhere all of us uh, are uh, maturing, if you will. Uh, none of us, once you get saved, you ain't grown. It's like once you get born, you ain't grown. You know, you know what I'm saying? And so we are going somewhere. We are growing uh, somewhere. So we want to talk about this morning about how Jesus uses his followers to respond to the needs of his neighbors. Now, we're going to start with Luke 9, verse 10. If you have your Bibles with you, once you get it, just say amen. amen. You know, I think churches ought to have some of that music like they have on the game shows. <laughs> While people are searching. <laughs> verse, uh, starting at verse 10. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who need, had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country 
and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two, uh, two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set them before the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. I think it's important that we talk a little bit about what happened prior to this event. Uh, there, uh, Jesus has his disciples in a training mode. He's teaching them something. He's trying to grow them up for a purpose. And so uh, uh, this is not the first time. He didn't just take them out and tell them to do something supernaturally without preparing them. So first, I want to talk to you about three words this morning. The first one is preparation. Matthew 4, 1 through 20 said, And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. They knew he was transforming them, although they didn't know to what extent. A lot of us have, we, we've left our old lives. We've committed our lives to Christ, and we don't know all of what that means. I mean, we, we know that we're going to have to change. That we, we know there's some things that we can't do that we did. We know that there's some people we can't hang around because it's not healthy, you know, for us to be around them. And so things are going to have to change. But we don't know what's next and what's coming. And he's preparing us. Some of us look back over our lives and see how much we've changed, how much our appetites and desires have changed since we first began walking with the Lord. As we become more intentional about deeper community with him, uh, communion with him, hopefully we mature to a greater uh, pace, mature at a greater pace as we submit totally to his will. The disciples had walked with Jesus. They had watched him. They had talked to him. They saw him perform miracles, you know, and, and, and you know what? Sometimes I wonder, what was that first time like? You know, what was that first time like when these fishermen get with this guy and all of a sudden he says, he says that somebody's eyes should be open and their eyes are open. Man, did you see that? Are you kidding me? You should have been there. The guy couldn't see nothing. And then all, of us, all he did was tell him, he said, be healed. And guess what? He was healed. You know, I mean, so this is, they're developing a relationship with him. They watched him cast demons into a herd of pigs. They watched him turn water into wine. He raised Jairus' daughter. The scripture records seven separate miracles from the turning water into the wine until now. And the disciples have watched it all. They've watched the whole thing. So they know it's possible for Jesus. I mean, he could do it. He Jesus. But one of the things that I had to come to the realization is that Jesus can't be a perfect example for me. Don't, don't nobody start throwing nothing, okay? It's a, I ain't finished. Let me finish. Jesus cannot be a perfect example for me if I can't do what he did. Huh? I mean, I mean, what good is an example if he's got an advantage? <laughs> I mean, he's got an advantage. He could do it because he's Jesus. Why would he require me to do it and I'm not? And he knew that we were going to think that way. That's why he put the disciples in the position that they were in where he expected them to do it first. 
so that we can know that normal earthlings can do it too. In the beginning, they must have thought how incredible this was, how incredible he was. Every time there was a sick person, I could hear it now, somebody would run, go get the teacher. Go get the teacher, go, go get the teacher. But now, prior to this event with the 5,000, he sends them out on their own. Preparation after preparation is activation. Now to activate the gifts, the power, and the authority he had given them, it's that time. This was their assignment with specific instructions. Luke 9, 1 through 5. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority. He equipped them so now they don't have to think that they have to do something that he did lesser equipped. Now... They can do what he did because he gave them power and authority. He gave them power and authority. Then he called the 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. In other words, don't even take a change of clothes. You know, sometimes the stuff that we have with us, we rely on it more than we rely on what God can do and what he wants to do. And, the, and when you rely on something else first, then it channels your thinking in the direction of that thing when our direction should be channeled in the, in the direction of God, who is the one that has given us the power and authority. I got, I got a couple of amens. I, I think it's warming up in here. <laughs> Come on, I believe it's warming up. Then he went on and he said in verse 4, whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. That verse used to mess me up. I wonder, what is that? What, I mean, what does that even mean? What he's saying is, when you, as you travel, when you stay at places, if they don't receive you as my ambassador, if they don't receive you with the power and authority I have given you, if they look at you when you start talking about what I've sent you to do, and they, and they go, boy, you crazy. I don't want to do that. The teacher does it, but you can't do it. You know, people are always talk you out of what God told you to do. <laughs> people can always tell you why... I mean, oh yeah, somebody else could do it, but not you. See, I know you. See, I know your family. I know the people you grew up around, and now nah, y'all ain't never gonna turn out to be nothing. You got enough voices going in your head about what people have told you as you were growing up. I know the, the folks I grew up around, they loved us, but they used negative reinforcement to motivate you. They thought, boy, you ain't never going to be nothing. Oh, my God. My da daddy's favorite saying for me, and don't get me wrong, I love my daddy. He was, the, he was a great man. But my daddy would look at me and say, I sure hope the Lord let me live to take care of that boy. That boy ain't never going to be nothing. I mean, and I heard that my whole life. You know how hard I have to work to get that voice out of my head? So when somebody tells me I'm going to give you a mission, you're going on this mission, you've got the power, you've got the authority, you've got everything that you need, why would I hang about around people that would, that would reinforce those negative voices in my head? That's what he's saying. He said, don't even take the dust from your shoes with you going away from that place. You don't need that.
Luke 9 and 6 says, So they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel. And guess what? Healing everywhere. Who did? That's a question. That's a test question. Who did? They did. And they did it, and Jesus wasn't standing there with them. But they did it because he convinced them that they could. Mark 6, 12 through 13 says this. So they went out and they preached the gospel. They preached that people should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil who were sick and healed them. They did and healed them. Now, I don't know why that, that, that it's just that one sentence that says that they, they healed them. I, I don't... Because to me, it seems like there'd be a whole lot more commentary about that. You know, it's almost like um, uh, when he's talking to them and he's telling them um, what they did and he's telling them about the success that they have had and he's telling them all of that. I mean, it just seems like I can hear all of them talking. I mean, just trying to talk over top of each other. You did what? Well, guess what? Guess what I did? You know, I, I hear him now, I hear him now, I hear, I hear um, uh, Peter and John talking about, yeah, we was going in the temple one day, there was a man sitting there, had a sign that said, homeless and crippled, anything helps, you know, and, 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 and Peter looked at him and said, well, brother, I ain't got no money, but I tell you what, what I got, I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Man, you should have been there. You should have been, I'm telling you, I ain't never seen nothing like it. You know, and they're swapping stories, so I don't know why. It's just one line that says everything they did. Because I want to know the stuff. You know what I'm saying? I want to know the details. But I, I really believe that God doesn't want us to get, let me see. I, I believe that God gives us enough details to encourage us, but he wants us to have our own stories. You know what, I ought to wrap up and go home right now. If, if you can get that, if you get that piece. I think he wants us to have our own stories, you know. This, okay, so then verse 9, Luke 9, I'm sorry, Luke 9, verse 10, the second part of the verse says this. Then he took them and went aside privately to a deserted place. Now, this is the place right here where that deeper communion comes into play. He, he takes them to a deserted place because it now has to be time alone just with him and them. I know a lot of people who absolutely love the Lord. They go to church every Sunday, but they don't spend time alone with him. They, they love sitting under the sound of someone teaching and hearing the stories, and they love it. It touches their heart so deeply, they'll start crying and all of this stuff because it means so much to them, but that's it. I know I'm not talking to anybody in here. I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm not. Um, one of the interesting things to me is that when, is that a number of times in Scripture when it talks about Jesus went to pray and he took his disciples. But then he took Peter, James, and John a little bit further. What that says to me is that he had a close relationship with his disciples, but he had a little bit more intimate relationship with Peter, James, and John. Huh? That's what I want. See, and then he went a little bit further, and he was with God. He was talking to his father. He had a more intimate relationship with him. I want to get closer and closer. This is what I'm striving for. I'm just talking about me. I want to get closer, and then I want to get closer, and then I want to get closer. And for me, the closer I get, the deeper communion that I have with him, then I, st I ought to see, start seeing some things that are different. I ought to start seeing some things 
that, that other folk aren't doing. Not that they can't and not that they shouldn't. But there's a deeper communion here. There's a deeper understanding. I'm close with him. He and I are sharing our heart together. We're sharing our deeper thoughts together. I want to know what he thinks. I want him to change. I don't want to change his mind. I want him to change my mind. That's the growing. This is the, this is the maturity piece I'm talking about. It's when you allow him. You never let anything stand between him, his thoughts, and him growing you up. And, and, and one of the things that, that, that hinders a lot of us, I mean, some, some folks, even their education, they, they know too much. You ever met somebody that just know too much? You can't tell them nothing. They don't have no experience at all. We used to, when I was in the military, we get so frustrated with some of the young officers that they never stepped on ship a day in their life. They went through college, they put on a uniform, and they sent them through a little train, and then they put them on a ship, and they don't know nothing. And it's hard to try to tell them something. And here you are with 10, 15, 20 years of experience. It's like, you know, God's trying to teach you something. He's got the experience, and you know too much. Okay. <laughs> didn't, didn't even get one. Amen. That time. Huh? <laughs> and so Jesus tells him, "You give them something to eat." He knew what they had, and he knew what they didn't have. But you would think that just coming off of this major tour that they did, with all the success that they'd have had, that they would have said, "They, I could see them fighting over it." You know, he said, you give them some, something to eat. I could see one of them going, I'll do it. Another one said, no, I'll do it. And, then, and, and I'll do it, you know. And, and Jesus telling them, well, you take that group, you take this group, and you take the other group. But that didn't happen. The first thing they did was came up with an excuse. Why do we do that? Sometimes we do it because we don't want to look bad if what we pray for doesn't work. We don't want to look like it was something wrong with us. It wasn't your power and authority. It was his power and authority. He gave it to you. And so if it doesn't work, it ain't your fault. It's his power and authority. Are you willing, though, if he, give, if he impresses upon your heart to step into a place and do something. Pray for somebody. Speak a word over somebody. Some of them won't, won't even do that much. Will you, will you take the step to do that? Because I believe that God is talking to all of us. You know, don't, I, 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 it cracks me up when people say, well, you know, God's not speaking to me right now. God's always talking. I love listening to Joel Osteen. I, I keep him on my radio in my car. And, and Joel Osteen is even, if you go out there to my car right now, it's playing now. But we can't hear it because we ain't tuned in. It doesn't mean he ain't speaking. We're just not tuned in. And the same thing is true about our relationship with God. He's always speaking but we're not tuned in. We're not listening. Sometimes we don't want to hear what he has to say in certain situations. But that's just, I'm just being real with you. And, 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 and let me get this, let me make this clear. When I say things like that, I'm not talking about anybody specifically, but myself. Because I know some of the things that I've done to avoid hearing from God in certain places when I was less mature than I am in the spirit right now. Right now, I want to know everything he's got to tell me, and I'm willing to do anything to get it. Because I've tried doing it on my own. <laughs> I can mess stuff up in ways you ain't never thought it could be messed up, you know, trying to do it on my own. But I'm the only one. I, I know. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm just talking about me. So 
So he demonstrated for him. He held it up to heaven. He presented it to God. And then when he presented it to God, there is nowhere in here, there's nowhere in Scripture, if you find it, you let me know. There's nowhere in Scripture that says that after he prayed, he looked down and the basket was full of fish. I hope y'all get that. Uh Uh-uh. When he finished praying, he still had the same amount of fish he started with. As they were obedient, as they were obedient, their supply was replenished. And sometimes our our supply isn't met because we haven't taken the first step. I'm ready to go home right now. I could, boy, you know, y'all ought to be on overload right now. Sometimes when God tells you to do something, you want to wait until you see everything show up that you can do it with, and that's not what he wants to do. He wants you to have faith for the first step. Can you take the first step? Can you do the first thing he told you to do? Even, I mean, well, but, but it don't look like it. It don't, no, 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 no. You're adding the stuff up in your head. You're trying to use that education you got that says that you have to have this in order to get this. And that's it. No, you just have to have a word from him and obedience. After activation comes participation. And this is where a lot of us miss it. We cry those big tears, Lord, if it be your will, if it be your will, Lord, heal, you know. But we're not taking the authority ourselves that he has given us. We are his ambassadors. So the question is, will you, will you make up your mind to participate with what he tells you to do, whether you feel you have everything that it needs, trusting him, trusting him. John 14, 10 says this, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, do I need to say that again, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater work, greater works. <laughs> I'd be satisfied right now just to see the works. But I really, my, 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 my goal is to see the greater works. I want to see greater stuff. I mean, how, the, wor- the works that I do, you will do, and even greater. He raised people from the dead. What can top that? You know, but I want to know. I want to see it. Because he promised. He said, the works that I do, you will do. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit 
dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We're not about to start no aerobics, <laughs> so don't, don't, don't worry about that. This, this represents your ministry. This represents that thing that God has called you to do. For some of us, it's a small thing. For, for some of us, it could be a larger thing. I, I don't know. I mean... God speaking to you, and he, he will speak to you about what he wants you to do. And those voices will start in your head telling you, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. You didn't come from that place. You know, we wasn't raised like that. You know, you know we, nobody's ever done that before. You know, all of those voices will come into your head. This glove represents me. By myself, there's nothing I can do to move the weight or to accomplish the goal or to whatever the task is. There's nothing I can do. I have been made in the image of a holy God, and when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, let, and let me clear this up right now. Some people will say, yeah, but I, I haven't been saved that long, so, so I've only got maybe a thumb worth of Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> no, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he fills you. Now, I have the power and the authority, not only the power to pick this up, the power to solve that problem, the power to pray for that healing, the power to pray for deliverance, the power. I have the right because I have the authority from him. That's what we need to get. We need to get to the place where when we see what God has called us to do, we do it. I don't know if you all watch the news, but this world is, is self-destructing at, at a phenomenal pace. And it is God's will that no one perish. It is his will that no one perish. Sadly enough, we know that people will. But it should not because we as the body of Christ weren't doing what he called us to do. I never heard the term Christ follower until, oh, about maybe 10 years ago for me. I mean, maybe, I mean, we were all, growing up, we were all Christians. I thought that I thought that was sufficient, you know, and, and then we have Christ followers. And don't get me wrong, I, I think being a Christ follower is a wonderful thing. But to what extent and for what? Because the truth of the matter is, the, the, I mean, the masses, the multitudes, they all followed Jesus. <laughs> they followed him. They showed up every time they heard the teacher was, was going to teach. They was like, I'm going over there. That's why it was over 5,000 people sitting there, because they were following him. But not all of them were doing anything. It was the disciples, the ones who wanted to get closer to him. Those were the ones 
that we see were, were doing the miracles. They were doing the work of Christ because they wanted to get close to him. And when he, got, when he separated himself from the masses, they went with them. And then some of them went a little bit further with him. How far will you go? How far will you go with him? I'm asking. Don't raise your hand. Don't yell out no answers. Answer that question in your own head. How far will you go with him? How deep a communion do you want to have with him? Because that's up to you. And, and we can, if we want to, we can, we can just show up every week and we can hear the message about what Jesus get, did and we can rejoice. We can be those people that, uh, that sit in the pews and, and when they're handing out fish, they'll give us some, you know. Or we can be the ones that are making the difference. We can be the ones that are making the change. We can be the ones that are, uh, that are representing him and doing the works that he did. We sing the songs, we are his hands, we are his feet. But all too often, his hands are folded and his feet are propped up. We ain't doing nothing, we ain't going nowhere. And I'm speaking from experience, so, so don't hear me. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm speaking out of my own depravity, out of, the, out of my own lack, okay? But as you listen to this message this morning, I hope that it brings you to a place where you say, what about me, Lord? What about me? How short am I in regard to what you would have me to do? And then be open to listen and allow him to renew your mind, to motivate you, to activate you, to be that moving force that, 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 that is a part of a church on the move, a church doing something. Let's pray. Father, we just thank and praise you, God, for all that you have shown us in your word. We thank you, God, for the examples that you have given us. I pray, God, that you would open our eyes and, and show us how to respond. Show us what you require of us. Show us, God, what we're missing because we don't want to miss it. We, God, we, we, we want to accomplish everything that you created us to do. We want to, God, we just want to do everything that you've called us to do. And we don't want to hear those voices in our heads telling us we can't do what you said we would. So motivate us, God. Speak to our hearts and our minds and Cause us to move according to your will and according to your voice, God, disregarding every negative voice that would tell us that we can't. Father, I believe your word, and we promise to act upon it. God, it is our desire that everything that we do and everything that we say gives you glory in the matchless name of Jesus. As the service close, closes at the end of service, I'm going to be down front here. And if there's anybody in here that would like prayer, I would love the opportunity to pray with you for whatever that prayer need might be. I would love to meet you down here. God bless you. I'd love to invite you to stand and sing with us. I'm going to go back and get it. After. Jacob, 
whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me oh we do oh god my god i need you oh god my god i need you now how i need you now oh rock oh rock of ages i'm standing
through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. From Deuteronomy 33, this is the God we worship together. Pour your hearts out to him at all times, says the psalmist. Trust in him at all times. He is worth trusting, and he is faithful. We worship the Lord by singing praises like this. We worship him as we encounter his word, and we worship him in the stewarding of our lives. And uh, thank you again, church, for being such uh, generous and faithful uh, givers to the work of the ministry year, uh, week in and week out and all through the year. As you heard Pastor Brian uh, mention in the video, we have a special project for November with Christ Followers for Change, partnering with sister churches in the area. Uh, there's a special unity moment next Sunday where all of those churches will be taking the special offering. We're going to do that here as well. So if you're waiting for that Sunday, awesome. Uh, we'll do that together as a symbolic uh, moment of unity with the other churches in the area uh, for this special project. But if you're an early adopter and want to be participating online uh, here through this week, you can do that this afternoon. You can do that anytime this week online, just designating to Christ followers for change. But again, next week week is the special offering that we'll do physically uh, together. And this is a project that it's intended to be above and beyond what we do normally as a church family, uh, just as a Thanksgiving time project uh, to really have an impact uh, both locally and worldwide for the sake of the gospel, right? Awesome. Uh, Pastor Brown's going to be down front, as he mentioned, uh, for prayer, and so will others uh, here by the cross. So if you'd like to uh, come up to the front and uh, seek the Lord for something going on in your life or in the life of somebody you love, we invite you to that today. And otherwise, I want to say happy Thanksgiving, and uh, the Lord bless you and keep you as you go from this place and as you gather with friends and family this week, and have a wonderful afternoon. Good day. <laughs> 